So today in this re skill refresh, I want to talk to you all about emotions, embodiment, and emotional regulation. There's so much information and research coming out within the fields of psychology and positive psychology about emotions, embodiment, emotional intelligence, and emotional regulation and their impact on our well-being. And that's why I think it's really important for us to stay on top of this as coaches, um, both for our own emotional health and well-being and for the sake of our clients as they come to us and we help evoke transformation. Um, as we partner with them in their lives. So a couple of things that I think might be important for everyone to understand is what emotions are and some of the research coming out around language and metaphor around emotion and then what's happening in our bodies when we experience emotion and what emotional regulation might look like in a healthy way that moves us forward um, kind of past our trauma responses uh, to particular stimuli, past our inner critic responses or our saboteur limiting belief sorts of responses into the next steps that we and our clients want to take. So to start with, emotions have two components to them. One is the initial reaction um, that happens in us as a sensation in our body when we experience a stimuli from the outer world. So for this example, let's say that my stimuli is that I experience injustice. So I see something unjust happening. The sensation that occurs in me is a heat um, that comes up through my chest and my neck and my face. Um, my hands get kind of cold. Um, because the I'm getting ready, really my body's getting ready to fight someone and we actually don't want much blood there <laughs> um, so that we don't have as much much sensation when we're, when we're hitting people. Okay, that's what's happening in my body as a sensation when I experience injustice and I can identify that bodily sensation as anger because I've experienced it enough times and that bodily signature, and I'll share um, an article with you about emotions and bodily signatures uh, in this newsletter, but that bodily signature is actually universal. So if I talk to someone about my bodily sensation of anger, they're like, yes, I fear, I've fear, i felt that too. Oh yeah, it does make your neck and your face hot, right? It does, that's weird. I never thought about how it made my hands cold. Um, and you, you can all, we can all identify with that because these bodily signatures for emotions are universal. All right, so that's the first part, this bodily sensation that we have in response to a stimuli. The second part is the expression of that emotion, how we use and manage it. This is why we can't really control or stuff um, emotion well and stay healthy. So um, say I'm in a meeting when I'm experiencing this injustice and I get the bodily signature of anger, that sensation, and I, it's just not an appropriate time for me to express that anger. Well, what happens if I don't express it somehow, if I don't later, you know, after the meeting's over, call someone and vent or punch a pillow or, um, scream it out in my car or whatever, then the emotion actually gets stuck at a particular level um, within my body. My liver and my gallbladder are trying to process the anger, but I'm not allowing the expression and use or management of that anger toward anything good. And so it actually gets stuck in my body and starts to cause illness or disease. Um, and isn't that crazy? Yeah. So. Um, Every emotion not only has a bodily signature, but it has a, a pair of organs, sister organs, that are meant to process um, that emotion through your body in something of a wave. So you'll start to feel the, um, the sensation of the anger, right? And as it crests into a wave, if there's not some sort of expression or use for that anger, um, then it either gets stuck and will get bottled up and you'll blow up later at some point, 
or it'll get stuck and you'll bottle up and blow up something internally, um, quite literally, that'll cause disease or illness in your body. So we want to be able to not just understand this is the sensation that I'm experiencing as a reaction to this unjust stimuli, this is the anger that I'm experiencing, but how can I express and use that anger in a way that's resonant? How can I choose to use and manage this anger in a way that moves it through me and creates something good from it in the world? And that's where we can come in as coaches, both in the awareness piece that leads to new insight around what's happening in my body as I'm experiencing this emotion Emotion, but also expressing and moving through that emotion in the present with process coaching in your sessions. Um, and as that's also why we kind of can experience empathy and anger with somebody else. We start feeling that heat. We articulate what's going on. Man, my neck really feels hot. My shoulders really feel heavy or something like that. So um, one thing uh, that we've found through research around metaphors and emotion is that we can kind of isolate all the metaphors that occur around emotion into emotion as force. So this is really helpful when we're trying to create awareness around emotionality and embodiment in our clients because we can say, all right, what's the emotion that you're feeling? Anger, where is that in your body right now? It's in my chest, okay, great. If you were to describe that as some sort of force of nature, what sort of force does it feel like right now? Well, it feels like, like a forest fire just started, right? Something like that. It feels like a tidal wave is just coming. It feels like someone hit my chest. All of those are uh, forces that we can then expand the metaphor around and say, okay, what would be a force to return or a force to, how would you engage with that tidal wave? Where do you want to be as that tidal wave hits? Um, what do you want to do with that forest fire? That sort of thing. And that's when we can start moving the emotion through our bodies, through its ex expression and its use. What's a choice you want to make about that and how you're going to make that wrong thing right? How can you use your emotion for good? Um, where do you see other people using anger for good in the world? That sort of thing. So um, <clears throat> one thing though, when we're experiencing emotions, a lot of times based on our um, history or just our beliefs about certain emotions, um, when that bodily signature comes up in us, it can activate something in our autonomic nervous system that says, no, 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 danger, danger, danger. We can't use this emotion. We can't use it here. We definitely can't use it this way. Um, and so we go into fight or flight and we can't come up with creative ways um, to express and use the emotion so then it gets stuck in our bodies again. So one thing that's helpful to know is there's a, a fellow in um, the field of compassion focused therapy right now, his name's Paul Gilbert. And Paul has t kind of taken a lot of information around emotional regulation and embodiment and he's helped us by dividing um, emotional regulation into three systems. Our drive system, our threat system, and our soothing system. Now to understand these systems, we need to understand a little bit about our autonomic nervous system. So our nervous system, you know, is our brain, uh, brainstem, the nerves that run through our spine and all through our bodies that help us um, engage with the stimuli in the world around us. Um, it's how we know where we are and who we are and what we're experiencing in this moment and what we experienced in the past. Our nervous system even gives us access to memory from our ancestors and um, empathy for the person sitting next to us. It's absolutely incredible how it works. And the more that I learn about our nervous systems, the more grace I have for myself and others, the less judgment um, I have and the more compassion I have for our, our collective pain and the individual expression of that pain. So um, when we talk about the autonomic nervous system, that's the part of our nervous system that's on auto auto reply, auto <laughs> autopilot, all of that sort of thing. So it's not necessarily um, parts of our nervous system that we have direct control over. It's digestion, it's breathing, it's heart rate, it's um, like feeling a touch when we have a touch, 
taking steps as we're, as we're walking somewhere, that sort of thing. So our autonomic nervous system is broken down into two subsystems, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And the way that you can kind of remember this or the way that I remember it is that the sympathetic nervous system starts with S and so does stress, right? And the parasympathetic nervous system starts with a P and so does paralyzed. <laughs> but what we, uh, what we really want to understand is that our sympathetic nervous system is where a lot of our stress response happens. So sympathetic nervous system in is in charge of fight, flight, or freeze, and our, our, threat, our threat response, our stress response when we're experiencing um, an away state, our sympathetic nervous system is very activated and engaged. <clears throat> our parasympathetic nervous system, think like, instead of paralyzed necessarily, think like relaxed, um, not going anywhere, that sort of thing. And that is our rest and digest um, functions within our, our parasympathetic nervous system. So that's where the soothe system lives. The threat and most of the drive system lives in our sympathetic nervous system. So what's interesting is our bodies were designed or are meant to live 20% of the time in the sympathetic nervous system. We can do that and remain healthy and functional and it not necessarily be a problem. And we're supposed to be about 80% of the time in a parasympathetic response in that rest, digest, contemplate, heal, ideate, imagine sort of place, right? Um, but most people, for most people that's switched because of pain or trauma or bad habits or whatever, we end up living 80% of our time in the sympathetic nervous system and maybe 20 in the parasympathetic. There are a lot of habits that you can start creating um, that will help you engage in the parasympathetic nervous system, but it's not just a good idea. Um, it's actually like will help save your life, <laughs> like heal you from, um, all sorts of illnesses and diseases and things like that. So we can identify which emotional regulation system is active by the emotion that we're presently experiencing. All right. And what we want and what we want to help train our clients in is spending as much time as possible in the soothing system. One way that you can do that is by training your vagus nerve, which I'll talk more about in the note from me this month in the newsletter. But, um, We'll start with the soothing system because when you are able to activate your soothing system and emotional regulation, um, you're feeling content, you're feeling safe, you're feeling connected. And so having those, understanding what those different bodily sensations and signatures are can help you say, oh, okay. Now I'm feeling safe, now I'm feeling connected, now I'm feeling content. It can also help you to understand what is the bodily signature of content, safe and connected, because if I'm over here experiencing something else, I wanna train myself to get over here. I can do that through lots of different exercises like breathing, meditation, other things like that. Um, but what's happening when we are engaging our soothing system is that we're able to manage stress and promote bonding, which if you remember love and connection are, um, as well as contribution and significance, are three of our basic human needs. And so it's really important that we're able to engage from a place of promoting bonding and managing distress. When we do that, we access more. We access room in our prefrontal cortex to think creatively and make really clear, good decisions. Um, we're able to focus really well. Um, it also releases opiates and oxytoc oxytocin in our brain through our bloodstream and our bodies, um, which make us feel good. And so that's why uh, deep breathing can be used as pain relief. It's why meditation can be used um, in emotional distress to step down from um, a flight or fight response. All right, so well, that's our soothing system. We wanna train ourselves and our clients as much as possible to, to live more and more and more in that soothing system because that's where we can emotionally regulate. But a healthy amount of time, we spend 20% of the time in um, our threat system and our drive system kind of bridges uh, both of those. So the purpose though, of our threat system is to detect 
um, and protect, right? So we detect warnings, we detect threats, we detect spaces that are unsafe for us for whatever reason, and it doesn't even need to be rational, that's not the point. So, because this particular threat system is um, is kind of housed in our vagus nerve and our amygdala. There are other uh, brain structures as well, <clears throat> but if you know that your amygdala is reacting with emotion based on what it's detecting and what it's trying to protect, um, it's not it's not coming from a place of rationalization. It's coming from a place of like learning and instinct and n deep knowing even if it's not rational. So what happens when we experience threat is that we release hormones in our pituitary gland as well as our adrenals. So we uh, release adrenaline and cortisol, which is why we get really amped up. Um, a great tool to use if you're um, finding that you and or your client are getting amped up in a session and the threat system is being activated is actually like shaking it out of your body, <laughs> shaking it out of your body and doing some deep breathing because you can kind of let the adrenaline and cortisol circulate that way um, and come back to um, a more, a more uh, centered state or uh, towards state by moving that through your body. The feelings that we get in um, within the, that tell us, oh, I'm using my threat system right now are anger, anxiety, uh, disgust, and sadness. Yep, and then the third system is the drive system. So when we're coaching, the threat system is gonna come up just because of change, let alone people's experiences. But we really want access to the drive system and the soothing system. So within the drive system, its purpose is to motivate us toward resources. So if we're motivated toward resources, that's when we can start thinking creatively and courageously about some things. We use a structure in our brains called the nucleus accumbens for this. And um, the drive system releases dopamine, which is a really, it's a feel good neurotransmitter. This, what, it increases self-efficacy, basically like when we're driven to do something and we achieve it and we do it, then it increases our belief that we can do the next hard thing, right? We can do the next creative thing. So the feelings that we get are feelings of vitality, excitement, surprise, um, and this, this sense of drive or motivation. There's actually um, a sensation around that too. So, um, we'll give you access to Gilbert's research as well as the bodily signatures research. Um, but the way that you take this and apply it in your um, coaching is several different ways. Still artic continue to articulate what's going on in you as you're experiencing bodily sensation, which is the reactive part of the emotion. Um, and ask questions about your client and their bodies as they're experiencing emotion in, in session as well. Another thing is try to become more skillful at how you express, use, and manage your own emotion and really dig into some of the, um, the research that we're gonna provide for you around some practices that will help you step down into your soothing system at a more rapid rate and stay there for longer. Um, if we can do that for ourselves and for our clients, then we'll be able to make really efficient use of their time in session. So one way that I'm um, activating this in my own coaching practice is by sending out um, invitations um, in between sessions to engage in certain practices like deep breathing, like meditation, like some of the vagus nerve uh, toning things that we'll be giving you in this month's newsletter. So I'd encourage you to do that or maybe even um, start and end your sessions with a particular ritual that will step both you and your client down into a soothing system. That's what clearing does. It's what some breathing can do. You can um, bring in uh, other soothing tools um, to help them step down and that they can have access to those throughout the sessions as well.